Hi everyone, Tim Bills and Bill Mildenhall here from Basketball Victoria. We're here from the Technical Officials Department, Bill, and we're here to talk today about 3PO mechanics and uh, teach you guys a little bit about the ins and outs of 3PO. But I guess, Bill, one of the biggest questions around 3PO mechanics is really about why was 3PO or three-person officiating introduced into our leagues? I mean, to our leagues in Australia was probably, oh, I had to think a number of years ago now, and the major reason was that uh, I think for the game was getting quicker and uh, and faster and the general consensus was that uh, the referees needed to be sort of up to up to speed with the, the, the game and it required sort of an extra person to sort of enable them to do that. Also part of the deal was that uh, I guess it's a bit like um, having three policemen on an intersection mm. that uh, if you have three policemen in there then hopefully you will reduce the, the crime yep. and so that's a bit the same on the floor. And from an Australian perspective and from our, our point of view, I think one of the reasons also was to enable us to develop referees to give those um, potential NBL referees, if you like, or the referees who are going to international events and the opportunity to officiate in three-person games. And in, in, in the development side of things, you can actually nurture someone along mm. um, with two experienced referees, and that was major, uh, one of the major reasons as well. Fantastic. Well, let's have a look at some uh, some diagrams and uh, we'll go from there. So we're going to have a look at some of the diagrams, some of the basic diagrams of 3PO, uh, three-person officiate. I guess the first slide we're going to look at is really the setup for the lead, centre and trail official. Perhaps just talk us through how this uh, how this diagram works. Well, these, this diagram here, Tim, is saying that the ball's on the left-hand side of the floor. So you want... Um, the, both your lead and your trail official being, both being on the same side as the ball is, and that's um, on the strong side. And your centre official has dropped down into that centre spot on the uh, right-hand side of the floor. Okay, excellent. And I guess also, too, it indicates primary areas of responsibility, and I guess what that's, that's what the shaded areas refer to. Yeah, so the purple or blue colour is the lead's major primary area, and the green being the trail's primary and then the centre has the um, orange or whatever colour you want to call that as yeah. being their, their primary. I guess in in a nutshell, I guess the basics of 3PO officiating is always trying to get two referees strong side of the ball, but I guess that doesn't always happen. Yeah, I mean, the aim is to, um, if you go back into the theory behind that, you know, that, uh, that there is two officials on the ball side so that they can cover where most of the action is. However... Um, as you appreciate, the higher the level of basketball you go, the more action often occurs away from the ball and not necessarily where the ball is. Yep. So it requires the referees to look beyond just simply their, um, their primary areas. Absolutely. If we flip the diagram here, um, you'll see from the other side, this is the right-hand side, so this is the strong side. So really, it's very similar setup, but it's just really flipping it. Yeah, it's pretty much exactly the same. So it just has... But it means, in normal circumstances, when you come down in transition... Often the lead officials will be on the on that other side in the first place, so you know they may then have to move across onto the um, onto the ball side once the ball changes position when it's coming up and down the floor. I mean, you look at the centre official here, and I mean we watch the NBL and have a little bit of a look, but the centre official looks to be sort of square to the play. But we really want to try and create those forty-five degree angles. Yeah, that's play. probably the directions there, Tim. You'd like the centre official maybe to sort of be facing a little more towards the basket so it is, ends up being sort of on a bit more of an angle they're, they're on a real you know square off with the line um, I think the encouragement now is for the center to sort of just swing around a little more to their right yep. so they actually have a 45 so the aim is to so that it, it broadens their outlook and broadens what, what area that they can actually see and certainly not X marks the spot either so. no not at all I mean these are I guess when you're learning three-person officiating, these these mechanics are really really helpful because it tells you basically you know where you should be in particular where the ball is. However, the more experienced you become and the higher you go in terms of your officiating, and the more games you get under your belt with three-person, the more emphasis then is placed on actually reading the play yep. and trying to understand where the ball is going to go next and where the players are going to be moving to which then uh, helps you to anticipate what will happen. 
I think that's the biggest thing that happens with 3PO officiating. They come down and referees just anchor themselves to one position. But really, we still want to use the 2PO techniques of moving around to try and... Absolutely. I mean, there's no difference. The players, just because you've got three people, don't, it doesn't mean that their players don't stop moving. Um, so they always move. And so it's a referee's responsibility. I mean, the basic principles are still always the same. You know, you be refereeing the defensive player but you must be able to see between the players to enable you to determine where the contact has actually occurred. So um, in any position, irrespective of leads, trails, centre, you have to move to be able to see the play. Bill, as we move to the next diagram, I mean, this starts to show, I guess, the referees extending their vision within their primary, but also outside their primary slightly as well. And there's obviously a lot of crossover in different types of areas, but it really is not about just refereeing your primary, but also about extending your vision as well. Yeah, and going beyond what's happening. So particularly if there's not much action in your primary, then it's a really good option for you to actually extend your vision to enable you to, to go to encroach into the other person's primary. To You know, it ends up being maybe we have two people on the same coverage. Mm. This is sort of quite a complicated little diagram, but if you break it down pretty simply... Um, it just it's expanding the vision of, the, of each of the three referees and you can see there is an overlap which then we, we encourage we don't have any problem with people making double whistles in those in those areas and I think one of the most important thing as well is I mean there is some extension within your courage but uh, uh, your own primary but also too we don't want referees ball watching either so it's really important that they concentrate on the competitive matchups within yeah, their area. Yeah again Tim the keys of officiating is and in particular in three person originally the I think the initial plans of three person was to to have at least one person watching the play and the other two watching away from the play mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. there was a concern under two person that you know that there's a tendency for referees to what to ball watch yeah. and no doubt that still happens in and referees need to force themselves when the ball is not in their primary area that in fact they don't start to ball watch but they actually look beyond their area. And you can see from that diagram, if we flip it this time, we talked about that centre referee too being a little bit higher. I guess that diagram sort of shows sort of, you know, heading out towards the middle of the floor but again it's just sort of having the centre a little bit higher and opening up their vision. Yeah, I think think the coaching now, Tim, is that... um, the centre doesn't have to be totally square to the line. Mm. They need to be sort of just on a little bit more of an angle. Yeah. And with the angle, that sort of just changes their, their coverage, if you like. But again, it's horses for courses. If the, if the play requires you to be standing on the line or in mm. that angle, then so be it. You mm. know, you get to the... One of the concerns we often face is that referees feel like they've looked at diagrams mm. and X marks the spot. So when the ball is here, you must be here. When the ball is here, you must be here and so on. Um, there is a hell of a lot of flex flexibility amongst all of this. Um, these are only suggested places that you need to be in. Yep. However, if the players don't set up the way that you want them to to enable you to see, you don't just stand in your spot because that's where you've been told to. You actually move to, to a C. I mean, at the end of the day, we want the referees to referee the, the players and referee the game. And, you know, if a decision has to be made and you you didn't see it because you weren't standing or you, you were following the instructions of standing on the line or wherever, then you're still going to be criticised, you know, so we still have to make calls. I think that and it's a really good point too. I mean, as much as we want referees to referee their primary, extend their vision, those sorts, if they do see something that's illegal out on the floor, we at the end of the day, for the sake of the game, we still want them to make the call to get it right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we would then question from a referee coaching perspective, mm. you'd then be asking your, your partners as to what, you know, what actually happened. Mm. But you try and tell a coach to turn around and say to them, where well, something really clearly has happened, and everybody, you know, Blind Freddy could have seen the incident, but for whatever reasons the referees didn't. Or the re- and then one referee whom did see it but said, oh, I can't call it because it's out of my area. You try and tell that to a coach and uh, I think you struggle. Well, as we move to the next diagram, we're looking now at, I guess, shared areas. And on this slide they call it dual coverage. But these are areas, I guess, where we could have 
both referees looking at the same play. It might be an on-ball, might be an off-ball situation. But from our perspective, we'd like to encourage double whistle still, same as our Supio officiating. Absolutely. And as it points out here, Tim, it's, this is shot coverage. You mm. know, So it's referring to dual areas of coverage, when particularly when players are taking the ball to the basket or taking a shot, because mm. um, they're the ones that we want to pick up on. So we don't, uh, no, we're not concerned about, uh, and the referees need to need to know the processes in terms of if there is a double whistle, that um, the, pl- the, the referee whom the play is coming from, so if they have the primary area of responsibility, then the secondary def- uh, official who called, makes the call it allows the primary to, to go ahead and take the call. So it's where it's originated from is really the one which is a bit of a change because previously we used to just simply say, oh, if the play was coming towards you, you'd make the call. But uh, now it's it's more to do with where the, the um, play originated mm. and if it ends up finishing with a, with a call being made, then the person who is primary has the call. I guess, Bill, there's also an emphasis on keeping the game moving and if we do have a double whistle type situation, the trail, I guess maybe the trail in this situation has a double whistle with the lead and it's got an open view to the score table, it's just easier for the trail official just to turn around and make the call and get get the game going. Yeah, absolutely. And plus, I mean, probably the the play originated from the trails area anyway, Mm -hmm. so that's Mm -hmm. that's the coverage. Bill, as we move away from basic diagrams and start looking at rotations, and I guess a lot of the a lot of the people listening to this will be very keen to look what uh, to really understand what a rotation looks like in three PO. Um, but I guess if you could just take us through some of the the basic fundamentals that referees need to keep keep in mind when um, looking at a three PO rotation. I guess if you go back into the basics, Tim, the reasons for the rotation is if the ball is now moved away from being on one side of the floor to the other. And so, therefore, if you go back to our principles, we want two referees on the ball side as many times as much as you possibly can. So, as a consequence, if the ball throws across to the other side of the floor, then the lead is the one who dictates the rotation. And the lead then has to move across the baseline. Um, and the, the key now is not to run across, but to actually move as quickly as you as you can, but walking. Um and there's a sort of two phases, if you like. When you are walking across the baseline, you continue to referee. You mm. don't just put your head down and take off. Yep. You actually scan. They you know, can call it scanning the paint. So you're looking at the, at the key area, so making sure that you're still officiating your area. Um, and there's a, bit of, there's a phase of what they, you'll hear of is the close-down phase. Mm. So it's the first lot of movement after about four or five steps towards going across to the other side of the floor. And this is just a, an area where you can, in fact, scan again and see where the play is and try to read the play. And if it looks like the ball is being kicked back again, there's no reason for you to continue to rotate. Mm-hmm. And so, therefore, it's a sort of it's a key for the other referees to, to determine. So when you get to the closed-down position, you can, in fact, what we call abort, so you can go back, mm-hmm. or you may continue and it's the, the lead who makes that ultimate decision. If you decide to, the ball's still remaining on the side, on the, the, the other side of the floor, then you actually continue to get to the close down and then you rotate by moving across, scanning the paint and continuing across to the other side of the floor and then taking up your position in that side on the lead. That then indicates and helps your fellow officials being remembering that now when you're coming across onto this side of the floor, under the right, left-hand side of the floor here, now your centre official is now going to have to move out to become the trail, and in reverse, the trail official will drop down to become the centre. And really, too, when we look at this rotation, when the lead decides to come to close down and starts to walk across the baseline to the other side, it's almost like a pulley system with the trail. He really needs to pull him with him because lead is switching off the area that he is in walking across, scanning the paint, and really want the trail to pick up Leeds' area of responsibility while they make that change. Yeah, and that's true. And in all three, really, should be sort of, if it works really well, it, it does look very smooth and mm. everything sort of, it does operate as a, as a pulley. Mm. But again, the key, Tim, is that we're, we're showing this, you know, to, to help people understand what we're actually wanting you to do. Mm. However, the, we don't lose sight of the fact that you don't just 
move because you're actually being told to move. You move because, you know, like for example, the the um, the centre is now moving out to being becoming a trail. If the play is right with them, we don't just because the lead now has moved across. We don't expect the centre to give up a really good spot yeah. just to move to get into the trail because yeah. oh, I've yeah. been told I must get to the trail spot. Yeah. Yeah. If they've got a really good spot in the centre and that's a great way of viewing it, then you remain there, you know, and that's what this um, diagram really in some ways is showing, that there's been a rotation but the centre's got a great great view. If they were to move in this play here, they would be getting straight line and they'd be in a poor position. I mean, this diagram here, Bill, shows that um, really clearly about the lead coming across on, on the baseline there and centre really holding their spot and then um, trail following play. And as you said, that centre official may have a good, um, between A1 and B5 there, might have a really good spot. And if he was to come up to trial, that makes him straight line. Absolutely. However, you know, if you watch, look on the other side, the trail now has dropped down to become a centre. Mm. And, you know, some people may say that you end up going, having two, two centres. centres yeah. um, and that's not, you know, like it's not the B end or the, the, the basketball court's not going to blow up. Yeah. So, you know, it just means that the centre is mindful of, on this side now, is mindful that they are meant to be the trail. And the only, the only problem you can get into here is if I haven't moved back to a trail spot and there's a rotation, uh, sorry, there's a, tran a um, transition, yep. then I've got to bust my boiler to get to the baseline. Yeah. And that's what tends to happen sometimes too is that you're looking at each other and going, oh, hang on, I need to get off to the races here, but one of you needs to go and um, bust your backside to get to the lead the other end. Bill, if we just have a look at some simple crew rotations, and these clips are from our Siebel Grand Finals last year, this one between Nutterwading and Hobart. But I really like this crew rotation here, and if we get more examples of this moving forward, um, this is the type of page that we'd like to be on. Absolutely, Tim. If, you, um, if we just watch here the lead, where the ball is now, the ball comes across into, drops down into area four, and the lead has moved across the baseline, but they got to close down position. Um, we'll show it, show it again. They've got to the close down position now. The ball comes into area four. They move across quickly, observing the play. And in that same process, now the trail, uh, the center of official drops out to the trail, and like a pulley system there. And there it goes, moves out to the trail. And also on the other side of the floor, the trail then has dropped down to the centre spot, making sure that he's then uh, observing his primary area as well. Bill, here's another example from the uh, from the Seawall Men's Grand Final. It's another good rotation. But there's a couple of things we can pick at it. But again, I like the way that uh, the referee gets to close down here, does the rotation, gets that one-on-one -on -one match up there, um, and referees will play really well. So... What are, you, what are your sort of further thoughts on that, or just, just having a bit more of a look at it? Well, if you look here, Tim, first off, the centre official is in a perfect position to be able to see between the play. Now, if that ball carrier had originally decided to drive to the basket, the centre official would have been in a perfect position to see the play, and also then the lead wouldn't have rotated because there's no reason to rotate. So they, if let's say, hypothetically, number 10 drives to the basket, as it is, he passes into the low post. Now the centre, uh, sorry, the lead decides to actually rotate across, having got to the close down. If you watch here, so now he uh, he posts up. He moves across because that's a good spot to be in now to be able to see between the play. And as a result, the um, centre official pops out to now become the trail and the. Um, trail official dro drops down to the centre on the other side. Bill, the next few examples we're going to see is about owning your own primary. And I guess a lot of referees are so used to just refereeing the ball carrier and the defender in their, their area. But these examples show activity that do happen away from the ball, but also within their area as well. Yeah, if we go back to our original diagrams, Tim, with the you know, dotted lines and whatever, it's emphasising that, okay, this is the area of your responsibility. So you must... Uh, and, and you have to work hard at being able to do this, is look beyond just simply the, the two players that uh, the ball carriers in your area because you are still responsible. It's your primary, so therefore it's going beyond what uh, just those two players. It's also the other, other activity around that. And that's where often it's very important to actually make, again, adjustments to enable you to be able to see something happening beyond 
the two players that you're sort of totally focused on? Bill, the next ex uh, example we're going to have a look at, and we call it stay with the player. It, it is part of the individual officiating techniques, but this is a really good example here. We don't get a rotation. The centre official does a really good job of following all the player all the way in and then uh, records a foul. Yeah, and because it is the centre's primary, um, and even though the the lead hasn't come across, they still must maintain um, their their vision and, and make sure that they they referee this play. And this is a really good example, as you said, Tim. Of um, and if you look the, when they first came down the floor, there was the ball carrier to the left. There was also those players setting up another play in the key, and you need to start to sort of be mindful of what's going on in there beyond just the ball carriers. Bill, earlier we talked about dual areas, shared areas, and about double whistles, and we've got some really good examples here where we encourage double whistles on play, and uh, uh, especially this time. It really does help with strength of call. Yeah, absolutely, and particularly when it's in the shared area, there's no reasons why you can't because that indicates that the officials are still covering their primary areas of responsibility. But it does. It certainly helps. Um, to be able to sort of look across and see that the other officials made that sort of call as well. And if somebody was to, to challenge you, you can say, oh, listen, me and my partner got the same call as well. So um, that, that helps you or uh, the cell, if you like. And also, too, I mean, these examples here, so I, I guess it, the ball's coming from trails, responsibility into lead, um, and then we get a call. So we're really encouraging our referees to stay with the play, but also to pick up the play early. Um, and if we end up with a double whistle, um, you know, so be it. Yeah. I mean, I guess the key that we don't, we just have to be so mindful of is when we have a double whistle, in particular with charge block situations, mm -hmm. where we've got one referee calling a charge and one calling a block. That becomes a little embarrassing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's really imperative that the referees get eye contact and they look at one another and, and, this, and determine who is going to actually go ahead and make the call. Bill, earlier we talked about uh, calls in the shared area, but also in that dual area as well. Um, these are the type of calls that are help calls, and, and we really encourage our officials to make help calls. And you can see on this play here, 13 Blue just gets in the back of his opponent and pushes him under the basket. The lead and the sender official on the floor don't end up making a call. We just watch this again. 13 Blue, just keep your eye on him. Just nudging out and getting the rebound and putting the foot back in. So trial official makes a call, not in the play, but we really want to encourage help calls. But I guess what are some of the principles around help calls and how we should officiate that? I guess the key to the to a help call, Tim, is that if you can, you try to hesitate and be just a little bit slower on the whistle so to give your partner the option and the opportunity to make the call. And if they don't then make the call, then you may end up being a little slower. However, it's very easy to justify, yeah, look, I was a bit slow, but uh, I got it correct. And the, the one, the first one, the example before, um, as a referee coach, we'd be then questioning, hang on a minute, why didn't the centre pick that up? Because they're in a, a reasonably good position. But the key is during the game, uh, all that's the most important thing is the, the actual call is made. You know, yeah. we, um, we can then coach that outside um, saying as to why it came from that other trail official when really it should have been the primary responsibility of the centre official. And it certainly happens a lot. The player might, uh, sorry, the referee may be straight line to the player, might be blocked, uh, might have someone walking past him at that point in time. So, I mean, the help calls are good. I mean, for the for the sake of the game. For the sake of the game, yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't we don't want to forget and lose sight of the fact that we still have to officiate the game, even though we have all these principles and mechanics. Bill, the next section we're going to talk about is cross calls, and it's one of the areas of the game in, in 3PO officiating that our, our referees need to be mindful of. But it's when the ball comes from weak side, it might be a one-on-one -on -one drive from the weak side, and the lead hasn't crossed over yet, still down and closed down, um, and there's contact, I guess, just on, on the other side of the semicircle. And we really want to encourage our referees when they can't see point of contact that I can see only the back of the defender is not to guess and I guess trust the centre official on the other side to perhaps cross step, have a good angle on that play um, and allow them to make the call. But I guess there are some times when Lee does need to jump in and make a call. Yeah, I guess Tim, it, it, this sort of highlights um, the fact of the benefits of three person because in a two person situation there's every chance that you're both going to be straight lined and as a result you're not going to be able to make a call 
or hopefully you don't make a call because it's going to be more of a guess than than a than an accurate call. But with three person, you're going to have someone else that's also having the opportunity to cover that play, that and they can often that opens up for them to be able to see that. So um, you know you, you would you don't mind somebody jumping in and making that call, but we're encouraging people not to 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 make the cross calls. Um, call on those from particularly in the lead when they're driving from that weak side. Yeah. It's pretty hard for them to be able to see the play. I mean, it's the terminology cross step, but I mean, people, you know, try and, but really at the end of the day, cross step is really just about trying to maintain a gap. Yeah, well, it? the cross step is, I guess, which is a bit different than that, the cross call, but the cross step is, the general principles have been forever and a day is when a player starts to drive to the basket, usually what happens, you follow that play and you, you move in the direction the player is going in. The cross step is now saying that you actually go in the opposite direction which the player is going towards so that hopefully the player opens up for you to enable you to actually see the defender, which is the key. You know, you must always be able to see the defender and, and also incorporate the offensive player, but the key is actually seeing the defender whether they have done something wrong. Bill, before we sign off, we wanted to have a look at some of the basic fundamentals around 3PO officiating. A lot of this sort of stuff is teamwork, and this is we're looking at last shots either in the end of end of quarters or even at the end of the game is quite important. But um, who's responsible for the clock? And I guess just walk through some of the, the examples that we have here. I guess there's the benefits also, Tim, of having three persons because if, if let's say hypothetically the trail has all of the play in front of them. I mean, it's pretty tough then to be able to be mindful of the uh, the shot clock and also, you know, the the state of the play or what they're doing. So in a circumstance like that, the trail, if the trail has got the play, then the centre would have the major primary responsibility of identifying uh, the last shot and whether it would count or otherwise. And reverse, if the play was on the other side and it was in the centre's primary and there was a lot of activity happening, then the trail should take on the responsibility of uh, observing the, the clock and the and the signal to make sure that whether the, the shot was to count or otherwise. And in the worst case scenario, scenario you then can ask your third partner, mm. you know, to establish, you know, whether they had an idea too, because hopefully we get the right answer at the end of the day. I mean, also too, I mean, throughout Basketball Victoria, a lot of the venues, the clocks can be in very different positions. And uh, this is something that the crew should talk about at the start of the game, about last second shots and, and how they're going to officiate that, because they may need to walk away from this diagram. Absolutely, yeah, depending on where the shot is and, and they need to have the, the person who's in the best position to make the actual call. The thing that usually throws their out to Tim is the fact that it catches you by surprise. Mm. So that's more of an issue in terms of you want to communicate amongst the group of, of your team, of your three that, hey, this is the last shot, there's a last shot coming up here, we want to be aware so that it doesn't catch us by surprise. Bill, this is the final diagram that we're going to look at. It's, we're looking at free throws here, and in some ways very similar to the 2PO mechanic, but I guess just walk us through the first and the second shot of how we should officiate this. This is obviously the first shot, um, and as you can see where the, uh, the active official, or, well, really the lead official is the active now because they've passed the ball to the shooter, um, the non-active official is out looking at the, the foul line, extended pretty much uh, along that line to make sure that the shooter doesn't encroach over the line. And the um, trail official, the, the most out official, have to be also officiating as well. I mean, one of the concerns is that we have that we, we tend to relax a little. Mm. Um, and they're looking pretty much at the players that are coming on, a, on the second shot in particular that are coming in from outside the three-point line. And I guess on the second free throw, Bill, I mean, really it looks like all referees are just in their normal positions to referee, but they still have responsibilities um, in, that, in that second free yeah. throw situation. And we don't want people switching off because there's a chance that there's going to be some sort of activity. And um, sometimes I think the next clip even shows, Tim, where the, there's some players back at the centre line or beyond the centre line. Yep. Um, then that out official must also be conscious of that and get into a position to be able to officiate them just the same as uh, they would be officiating any other players on the floor. And I guess if the ball, the second shot misses, I mean, it's really all referees in the right spot to referee um, as they would normally normal Yeah, normal you, don't want, you don't want somebody then having to adjust and whatever because they, they had an opportunity to get in a good spot 
and they didn't, and then they uh, then they have to adjust. And you know, as you know, anywhere on the floor, when you start to adjust, there's a chance that you may not get to that spot quickly enough, and as a result, you may see things differently. Bill, now that we've had a look at all the clips, I guess just signing off, just to throw to you, perhaps just to talk to those uh, those viewers that are having a listen to this about what what are the key takeaways you want them to take away from this uh, from this exercise. Uh, I guess the the points that we really f- want to focus upon is that um, the referees referee their primary area, which is you know the most significant, and that's mm. when the players in their actual area, then they're responsible for that. Yep. Um, we don't mind somebody looking outside of their primary area and you know we call that in the secondary space i guess um and in those circumstances when there's shared areas we don't have an issue with even double whistles Mm. um we don't mind that sort of thing because it means the game is being covered but uh and then if someone's going outside of their area and to to really help somebody else out the key to that component is to make sure that you sort of give the the official who's it primary it is mm. the opportunity to make the call if they don't make the call then you can come in over the top and make that call and that that's one of those calls you actually have to be very confident that you yep. you are correct in what you're making yeah absolutely well hopefully uh, this video has been helpful and uh thanks bill and uh we look forward to catching up again soon thank you